I see my two heroes beat me to the chuck wagon. Good morning, dear. Have you settled it yet? Or is it still uh, pistols for two and lunch for one? We compromised. I'm going to school. Good. Now look, Danny. You think I'm a fathead? No, sir. Have you ever heard me give you any pep talks about getting good grades so you can make a fast buck when you get in the outside world? No, no, I gotta be gone. I'd like about 30 seconds more of your time, if you don't mind. I'd also like to maintain a sense of proportion and perhaps a little humor about this situation. Now, this boy, Eric Hardiman, was told by the principal of the school not to wear a black leather jacket, some jeans, and boots to his classes. He refused to accept that order, so he was expelled. Now, you're boycotting that decision with a ridiculous and noisy protest is flouting the proper authority. Now, why support some troublesome nut? I mean, he's getting exactly what he deserves. Now, what is it left to talk about or say about, anyway? Nothing. Goodbye, Mom. Bye. Did you use thumb screws, darling? Ah, very funny. Fact remains, he's going to do what I ask him to do, and what I don't understand is he, someone you can love and you can care for can suddenly become a total stranger to him. Why all this hostility? He resents every single thing I ask him to do. Well, we've always encouraged Danny to speak his mind. Well, honey, I realize there are two sides to every question, but is there a natural law of some kind that says that, that my side is always wrong? Well, of course not, dear. Is there a natural law that says you're always right? Well, I am right this time, and you know I am. Look, look, Danny feels that what happened to Eric Hardiman was unfair. Now, maybe he was stubborn or even a little insulting last night, but it's a matter of principle with him. That's why he wanted to protest today. I know, darling, but the fact that they're protesting doesn't necessarily mean the protest is valid. Well, now, I'll see you at ice time. Insight, stories of spiritual conflict in the 20th century. Insight. The family, like every other human community, requires authority. Somebody has to concern himself with the common good and see that everybody's interests are protected. In most families, this authority is the father. He makes the rules which govern the family's life. This is as it should be. The other members of the family, especially the young adults, owe him obedience, and he owes them a reasonable and considerate exercise of his authority. His concern must be their welfare the major ingredient of which is the development in them of the responsible use of freedom. He must help them think for themselves and make their own decisions. He must even on occasion allow them to make their own mistakes. But what does a parent do when a son or daughter uses his freedom irresponsibly? And what does a young adult do when one of his parents exercises his authority in an arbitrary fashion? Yeah? One king-sized headache. Thank you, my friend. Exactly what I need. The laboratory check in our new account. Flash spray. 98% water with a touch of glycerin and a coloring agent. And retailing at $7.50 a gallon. Probably won't hurt the surface of a car. That seems like the kindest thing chemical analysis can say about it. David, it's a pure fraud. I think I'll kick this particular hot potato up to the king of the hill. Judy Dave Anderson here. Mr. Burton in? Can we get back to you, Mr. Anderson? He's talking to New York. Well, I'll be here for about another hour. See if you can squeeze us in for a few minutes. This is uh, rather urgent. <laughs> David, do you know what our leader's going to tell you? 
if we don't take the business... It's going to walk into the shop next door, but the least we can do is go on record. Any further problems? No, no. Everything else is going smooth as silk. Okay. Yes, hello. Dave? Oh, hello, Meg. Uh, I debated all day whether to call you, but, uh... I didn't want you to walk in the house cold, so I decided I'd better tell you. Tell me what? Danny didn't go to school today. He didn't go... What do you... Who told you he didn't go to school today? Mr. Kent called this morning. Uh, if he doesn't go tomorrow, he's going to be expelled. All right, never mind the details. I'll, I'll be home right away. But I didn't lie to you, Dad. I really meant what I said about going to school. You said you were going to go to school, and you didn't. Now, I don't know how you're going to sweeten that, Danny. Unless, of course, you figured it was a half-truth, or perhaps you had your fingers crossed under the table. I said I, I was going know. to school, and I meant it. But when I got there, I just couldn't go in. Why? Because you were afraid of the opinion of a half a dozen rebellious idiots? Oh, that wasn't it at all. Well, then what was it? Dad, they aren't booting Eric out of school because he wears a black leather jacket and jeans. They've been looking for an excuse to tie a can to him. Ah! Are you trying to tell me that a group of educators with the responsibility of, of thousands of boys and girls have selected this Eric Hardeman as their particular victim? Look, would you talk to Eric? Maybe then you'd understand. I'm not interested in understanding Eric Hardeman. I'm interested in understanding you, and that's plenty. Eric Hardeman is not my responsibility, nor is he yours. Well, I think Eric is my responsibility. All right, you're entitled to that sentiment. But you're not entitled to activity that's going to get you kicked out of school. All right, young man. I want to know what you're going to do tomorrow morning. I don't know. I see. Then I'm going to help you come to a decision. Let me have those car keys. You couldn't. I couldn't? What the hell have you got to protest about in the first place? You've got your own room upstairs with a closet full of clothes. You've got an allowance. All the food you can eat, and a sports car to boot. Let me have those keys. And one more thing, Dan. You go to school tomorrow morning, and you can come back here tomorrow afternoon and pick up these keys. You don't go to school tomorrow morning, and I'll sell this car by tomorrow night. And you'll be a lot older, and hopefully a lot wiser, by the time you can earn enough money to buy one for yourself. Dave, Danny went storming out of here with steam coming out of both ears. Good. Let him sulk. Maybe it'll help him think a little bit. But what'd you say to him? I told him he either goes to school tomorrow morning, or tomorrow night he finds that sport car of his in a used car lot. Dave, you can restrict him, but... selling it, that, that car is so important to him. Well, so is his education important to him. And one more thing is important. Remembering that I'm the head of this household. talk to you for a minute? Well, all right, yes, uh, yes. If you, uh, you notice I'm a little less than cordial to you, I'm sure you'll understand why. Huh? Sure, I understand. Mm -hmm. I don't blame you. 
You know, I wanted to tell you that it wasn't my idea for Danny and the rest of those kids to walk out of school. That was crazy, you know. They're gonna get in worse trouble than they were in. I agree. I sure do. They're bucking a system. And it's best they find out now rather than later that it's a fight they're not gonna win. All right, young man, what kind of a nut are you, anyway? Well, I don't know. That's the worst kind, I guess. See, I wanted to tell you that it wasn't the clothes got me booted out of school. They don't even have any dress regulations at Union. Kids there wear all kinds of crazy things. There's this one guy, he comes to school all the time in a buckskin jacket with fringe all over it. There's this other guy who wears a great big poncho, his brother got him in the Navy. Some of those kids look like they dress in the dark out of a laundry bag. All right, if it wasn't the clothes, then what was it? Well, they got mad at me. They got mad at me, see, because they got this idea somewhere that I'm some kind of an agitator, you know, a communist or something. Well, are you? What? A communist? Well, I don't know. I mean, that's what we go to school for, isn't it? I mean, to... Oh, hi, Eric. Hi. I just came over here to tell your father you're acting like a fool. Well, I don't think I am. See, Danny and I were talking about this just earlier this evening. You say the teachers don't like you, huh? Well, they don't like... I mean, I don't blame them. Mm -hmm. Well, we were talking about this just a little earlier this evening. You see, I just don't understand you fellas at all. As far as I'm concerned, you've got it made. You've got cars, clothes, you've got allowances. I had to walk two miles to school every day through the snow. I was a dropout also, but not because I had to, I wanted to go out and drag race someplace. Because I had to earn a living. I got my education by reading books and going to night school. Yeah, I, I know. We only read about the Depression. You guys went through it. You know, it's funny. You sound just like my old man. He only went to school during blizzards. Yeah, sometimes I wonder if there wasn't a fall or spring when you guys were kids. Dad, why do you relate everything to things? Like the car and food and clothing? But if you didn't have those things, maybe you'd understand. But we do. We do. Is that what you resent? Re resent? See, Mr. Anderson, I, that's how I got in all this trouble. Over things. See, I try to tell my father that the only way I can understand him is to go through the same things he went through. So... I mean, I told him I, I have all those things. I got the cashmere sweaters and the slacks and everything, but I, I just got rid of them. See, so I went out and I bought these boots. I only paid two dollars for them. And, and then I went to a, a surplus store and I got the, got this uh, jeans and everything. I got this jacket. I only paid six dollars for the jacket because it's not really real leather. See, and uh, well, I, I did all that because I wanted to know what it was like to feel uh, second rate, you know. And I went on a fast, just like Gandhi. He said a beautiful thing. Hey, you know what he said? No, what did he say? He said, mankind will die if there's no exhibit anywhere, any time, of the divine in man. I see. Now, what's that got to do with what we're talking about here? Oh, it doesn't have anything to do with it. It's just beautiful. Well, I don't know, Eric. Maybe it does. Well, no, no, no. Anyway, it's, that's not what I want to tell you about. So I, I stopped taking my allowance, and I uh, gave up my car keys. Is it all right to have some coffee? I gave up my car keys and everything, and I did that so I, I wanted to know what it was like to be, uh, to be hurting, you know, like, like my old man did. You mean you, you, you did all this stuff just so you could understand your father? Sure. See, I, I did it out of love, because I read somewhere that to share pain is to share humanity. Well, I don't really know what that means either, except that it's, it's really beautiful. How'd your father react to all this? Well, he thought I was putting him on at first. But then after a while, you know, when he figured out that I... I wasn't kidding, or I, you know, I wasn't trying to make fun of him or anything. He went right through the ceiling. Right through the ceiling! You should have seen him. He was screaming and yelling. It was like a, it was like a shootout. Hey, Eric, tell him about the Battle of the Bulge. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> well, I think he didn't really mean it. I mean, the old man's really a good guy. Well, you see, he had the war and the depression. He was wounded twice. Well, anyway, we, we were sitting around the house one night, and he got kind of stoned, and... Well, he started to talk about how he never had any allowance, and uh, he never had any car, and how he had to go to work for the Pullman Company for 40 cents an hour when he was 18 years old. And I just stopped him. And I looked him right in the face, and I said, Dad, I don't have any allowance either. And he just came unglued. He got up and he started yelling and screaming. He got all red in the face and he yelled at me. He said, where were you during the Battle of the Bulge, kid? 
<laughs> I reminded him I wasn't even born yet. And then he said, and this was really sad. He said, well, I didn't need you anyway. And I just went upstairs and went to bed. And I knew then, the first time, that he wasn't young anymore. Well, you know, Eric, some fathers just aren't ready to accept No, that. no, it was my fault. You know, you always say that, you always take the Well, it was my fault. I mean, I never, I never think anything through logically. I don't know. I, I, I don't read all these books I don't understand, and I'm always shooting off my big mouth. Like that article I wrote for the school newspaper, you know, that one about burning the American flag? Burning the American flag? Now, a lot of good men died to protect that flag. Oh, I know. I know. But see, if you turn that around, it's an indictment. See, all I meant was, I just asked a question. I said, wouldn't it be great to have a flag that nobody had to die for? You see, Dad, this is what goes on at school. Eric thinks things should be talked about. Yeah, see, I, I didn't mean for anybody to go out and burn the American flag. That's crazy. I never meant that. I just mean it, we have to get out of these little boxes that we're in, these nationalistic little boxes, so that any time somebody starts yelling, kill the Russians or kill the Americans or kill the Chinese, they just don't point to some flag and say, that makes it fine. That's how I got in trouble with the city council. The city council? Yeah, my big mother. I wrote this other article about sending congressmen off to war, see? I said in the article that if a congressman votes for war, he ought to have an alternate that replaces him, and then he has to go enlist in the army the next day. Well, that's well, the it... silliest thing I ever heard of in my whole life. A congressman off to... Let me ask you something, Eric. If you sent your congressman off to war, who'd run your government for you? Well, that's another question. That's another question. I mean, who wants a government that's run by a lot of guys who send millions of people off to war and then just stand around and watch? See, what I meant was that if a congressman knew he was going to be a buck private in the army the next day, he'd probably think about it a little. Oh, hi, Mom. Mom, I want you to meet Eric Hardin. I'm pleased to meet you, Mrs. Anderson. It's my pleasure. All right, now that we have all the doves flying high, I uh, suppose you tell us how you got yourself involved with our city council. Well, I don't know. I guess they got hold of a copy of the school newspaper or something. See, I was in history class with this uh, uh, Mr. Melton, you know him. And uh, he's a really kind of groovy guy, too. I think he likes me. He read me something out of a book. He said, it's the duty of a patriot to hate the evil in his country creatively. I don't understand that. Well, he means like uh, there was an institution slavery in this country. Well, if nobody hated it, we still have it. Uh, let's get back to the city council, shall we? Hmm? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, I got this call to go up to the principal's office, and I got there, and he was standing there looking like somebody had been swearing in front of his mother or something. And there were these two guys there, middle-aged, kind of nice guys, and they started asking me all these questions. They, they wanted to know why I'd written the article. They asked me if I was trying to be funny. I told them no. I said... I mean, just because I wrote the article doesn't mean I think it's going to happen. And then they started to ask me, they asked me things like about my father's politics. Well, that's nutty. I mean, my father's slightly right of McKinley. I mean, he doesn't even believe in a government-owned post office. <laughs> and then they, they want to know all kinds of things. They want to know who my favorite people are in the country. They want to know what kind of books I read. They want to know if anybody asked me to write the article. They want to know if I got paid for it. Well, that's all there was to it. Eric, school just isn't the place to get the kind of answers for the questions you're posing. Well, maybe not that, but isn't it a good place to ask them? Yeah, I mean, isn't it better to ask them there than out on the battlefield? When did Mr. Kent ask you to stop wearing those clothes? Was it before or after you talked to the city council? Oh, it was before. Well, Mr. Kent's a great guy. He doesn't believe in all that stuff. You know, he didn't like that business about the councilman any more than I did. Tell me something. Uh... How did you feel when Mr. Kent told you that you couldn't wear those clothes anymore? Well, I felt scared. Very scared. But I had to say no. I mean, I, I tried to explain to him why I was wearing them, but I just couldn't get through to it. Well, I can't say I completely 
disagree with you, Eric, but I, I, I'd like you to understand something uh, from my point of view here. See, I think uh, an educational system is like, a, is like an industry, you see. And there are rules and regulations. Now, wait, that's not a bad thing for guys like you. Now, listen to me. Rules and regulations can give you an idea of what you can expect when you get out in the world. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean it's more of the same? We have to shut up if we have anything unpopular to say? Take orders that don't make any sense? No, no, no. I, no, I think you're putting those in, in uh, very extreme terms. No, no, Danny, I, I, think I, I think you're putting in pretty extreme terms yourself. Well, I'm probably not making myself clear. What, what I'm trying to say is that uh, to get along in this world, you see, I, I mean, to make a living in this world is, is not like raising the white flag. I mean, decisions that are made in the business community today are not, well, they're just not necessarily a, a moral crisis, is what I mean. Yes. Oh, no, of course you're not interrupting anything. Uh, if you were, it wouldn't make any difference. Yes, he's here. I'll get him. King of the hill. Excuse me, boys. Well, hello, Mr. Burton. I tried to get back to you this afternoon. Your girl told me you'd taken off early. I wish I had, too. New York seems to think I haven't got anything to do but listen to their problems. You know what I told Harrison? I said, this isn't an advertising agency. This is a complaint department. <laughs> well, I bet that amused them. Well, I'm not so sure it did. But, Dave, you've got to slap them down sometimes or they'll overwhelm you by sheer numbers. Now, what's your problem? Well, it's a little complicated, but I think we can take care of it tomorrow, sir. Well, you said it was urgent. Well, it is, but... Uh... Well, let's have it, then. We can both sleep on it. I like to start a day with solutions, not with problems. Well, it's a flash spray account, sir. Oh, that's going to be a money spinner, day. These kids today will buy anything to shine up their heaps. <laughs> well, it just doesn't seem to be living up to its claims, sir. Who told you that? Laboratory. It's overpriced, for one thing, and it's... Uh... Well, it's just dubious value all around. Oh, no, Dave, that price tag is none of our business. It's a big account. We need it. You got a sudden <laughs> dose of martini morality? <laughs> no, no, sir. But flash spray is 98% water with a drop of glycerin and a touch of a clutter coloring agent added to it. Well, so what? You know, kids today have got plenty of money. Better they spend it on... Flash spray than LSD. Those crazy records they play around the clock. Well, that's not the point. Okay, what is the point? Well, the point is, uh, are we going to lend the name and the talents of our ad agency to a product we know to be absolutely worthless? Well, no, Dave. If we don't take the business, it'll just walk into the shop next door. We need the business. That's the point. But I can't dress up lies so they're not still lies. Now, Dave, I can't run a shop with prima donnas. You know what you're doing is offering me your resignation. I, I didn't say anything about quitting, sir. Well, then you'll go to work on the flash break account first thing in the morning. Uh, Mr. Burton, I... I can't write for that account. Don't be a sore head, Dave. I'll give you until tomorrow morning to think about it. Get some sleep. All right, I'll give you my decision tomorrow morning. What are you going to do tomorrow morning, Dad? What are you going to do, son? I'm not sure. Well, neither am I. I've got an idea that might help you make up your mind, though. Take a spin through the park. It might help clear your head a bit. Come on, Eric. I can't dress up lies so they're not still lies. That was beautiful.
That was really beautiful. Hey, you know, you really got style. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much. you uh, feel when you told off Mr. Burton? I was scared, Meg. I was very scared. Decisions. We all face them all the time. The alternatives are seldom black and white, and choosing between them is never easy. But only a human being can make his own decisions, govern his own actions, and create the shape of his own life. And the hardest thing of all is taking responsibility for what we do. That's the price of freedom, and it's freedom which makes us human beings. The man who's really free is open to the world around him. He listens to it and he allows it to enter his being. He is also open to himself. His interior life is constant dialogue. Imagination and memory, emotion and intuition, conscious and unconscious mind, they all play their part. He listens to them all, and he listens to the spirit of God who lives within him. Such a man is able to commit himself totally to whatever he chooses because he lives in constant touch with every element of his own being. Some people are afraid of that kind of commitment, or they refuse to open up and listen. They live on the surface and never get in touch with their own real selves. Other people do open up. They face reality, but they are afraid to relate to it for fear of the responsibilities involved. It's sad, isn't it, to see dead people walking around, going through the motions of being alive, but not really living because they've abdicated their freedom. It's a temptation we all face. The price of freedom is expensive. I think it's worth it. I'll go further than that. I think it's a bargain. Insight is a production of the Paulist Fathers, a group of Catholic priests who serve their God by serving those outside their church.